All right, so this is episode uh, five of the Dirty Troughs series, and I'm privileged to have my son Carter and my grandson Ransom Buto here to talk today, um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk to Carter about his work. Um, just you know by you know by introduction, you know this is called the Dirty Troughs series, and it and it's off of you know the the verse in Proverbs that says. Um, you know, where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes through the strength of an ox. And the idea behind that is, is that you know, productivity um, makes messes. You know? and, and so you, know, you, you can have a very pristine and clean environment, life, whatever you want to call that, um, but that might indicate you're not being very productive, whereas you can, yeah, when, when you're being productive, it creates messes. And so we want to talk about a little bit about work and yourself, and uh, and then you know maybe talk about some of the messes that you encounter in work and how you deal with that and how your Christian um, uh, life and principles and worldview informs how you deal with those things and how you um, how you approach them. And so um, so anyway, we just want to start with um, you know who you are. Mm -hmm. you know, so tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. All what right. kind of a great family you came from? <laughs> uh, I'm. Carter Buto, and uh, I'm eldest son of Chris here. So I grew up in Duval, Washington. We lived out there until I was about 10 or 11, then we moved to Bothell. And I've lived in the area my whole life then. I went to, went to college at University of Washington and met my wife, Elia, while, we were, while I was there. Um, she was already graduated from Seattle Pacific at that point. After I graduated, we lived in Redmond for a year. We lived in Mill Creek for a few years, lived in um, downtown Bothell for a few years near downtown Bothell, and now we live in Maltby here. Um, and uh, so I studied uh, computer science at the University of Washington, and after, or my, before my senior year, I interned at Amazon, and then that turned into a full time position at Amazon. I worked there for four years after I graduated, I think. And then I transitioned to Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for, I think it's seven years, this, seven years this summer, um, coming up in July. Um, at Microsoft, I'm a software engineer. Um, I've been working, I started working in Skype and then I got moved over to Teams. I've been working on Microsoft Teams for, uh, I guess it's like, Three years now, something like that. Um, maybe four. I don't know. It's been a while. Yeah. And uh, work on uh, Teams, uh, some Teams features for schools, Teams for education. Some of the features that Ransom and Sam used at Providence when uh, when we were remote for a few months there. That's the overview there. Covers it pretty well. So I see you have at least one child. Do you yeah, have any others? Uh, Ransom is our oldest. He's nine years old and got. Got four younger siblings, uh, three younger brothers, and one younger sister. And the youngest is just one. So you just you know you you, you just kind of re recounted your work history a little bit, um, and a little bit about what it is you do more specifically within Microsoft. You know you kind of work in Teams, in that Teams environment. Um, at, at Microsoft, I've, I've always wondered about this. You know, do, do they do they call? Like when you see other Microsoft people and you want to know what they do in Microsoft, how do you fr how do you phrase that question? What team are you on? Because I always have you know I'm on the Teams team. That's yeah, that's it is awkward. Yeah, <laughs> or Teams so, specifically. So like, how do you ask somebody else at Microsoft like, where do you fit in this big organization? Yeah, uh, it's probably mostly what team are you on, yeah. and then that can kind of mean different different yeah. things to different people. They the way they answer it may just vary depending on how you know far away in the in the company you are. From. Yeah. So what what interested you in computer science? You know why why you know you, you studied that in college? Mm -hmm. um, how did that come about? You know because I I know when you were growing up, you know, really interested in literature, books, mm -hmm. you know, writing, um, you know, philosophy. Some. I mean, what what um, eventually brought you vocationally to mm -hmm. computer science? Um, yeah, I had a well. I know growing up, I had a string of things that I wanted to be, I'm pretty sure. I wanted to be a soldier. That yeah. was the first one that I remember wanting to be when I was, read a book about West Point, I think, and then 
wanted to be a chemist for a while, um, and I uh, definitely wanted to be an author for a good good stretch after that, uh, because I liked books so much. Yeah. Um, I think, I guess, I know I had never touched any kind of software before, like my junior year or so of, uh, of high school, and hey Sam. Hi Sam. Have a seat. This is Sam, my number two son here. He's next oldest after Ransom. How you doing? Good. Want some coffee? <laughs> no? How about a pipe? Well, what? No! No? Okay. <laughs> uh, I think I, I don't remember if it was my junior or senior year, I, st I found out about the um, programming abilities that the that my graphing calculator had and um, I think I mostly used that because I think I explored that because Mr. Morris said that we could whatever our calculators could do was fine for them to do on tests and yeah. things so I eventually figured out a way to encode some of the stuff that I didn't want to have to memorize yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and then figured out how to transfer that to the calculators of everybody else in, yeah. the, in the class as well <laughs> and um, so it was uh, that wasn't there wasn't a lot of real programming but it was it was pretty cool feeling to take this device that had just been you know something that it had functionality that I consumed from the device that I you know I could enter numbers and it would tell me the answers and, and instead be able to put my own functionality on there I think was a pretty cool sensation and um, I think that I started exploring some other I think I did a, a little bit of web development around that time too just to kind of just building basic websites just to see what that would be like um, and I guess I was just hooked at that point and when I learned that that was something you could do in college then uh, that sounded pretty good, so uh, I, I don't, I don't think that in my mind there was any sense of like, oh, there are really good careers that come out of this at this point. I, I don't know if that's something that you guys were aware yeah, of. Yeah. I think, oh yeah, we gotta, yeah. <laughs> we gotta push yeah. them towards towards Do this that. option. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I, it was just something that I enjoyed. And then in college, once I really, I, I didn't do any real programming until I started college. Uh, I probably had done less when I, in my freshman year than most of my classmates who went into computer science because a lot of them had been doing software development earlier on. Um, and uh, I think at that point it, it turned into a real like passion and love for, love for software development. So I, there was never really any, any doubt that that was, that, you know, that was the career that I wanted to go into at that point. That's cool. Right, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Either I want to be a video game programmer, or I want to work at Pokemon. Very nice. Cool. You know, oh. Pokemon makes video games. Take a deep ball. How about you, Sam? A, a, a chef. You want to be a chef? Cool. Well, maybe maybe Pokemon has a cafeteria, and you can be a chef in the Pokemon <laughs> cafeteria. You guys can work together. Yeah, yeah Sam's got his plan for his own restaurant, right? You have your own restaurant? What's it going to be called? Surf's Up Seaweed. Surf's Up Seaweed. Ooh. Yeah. It's a very, uh, very targeted audience there. <laughs> so, very cool. So, um, so what are some of the challenges that, that uh, you encounter in your work? There's lots of different challenges, I think. I think almost every, you know, every worthwhile thing that we do is mostly challenges. If you're, yeah. if you're not facing challenges, then you're really just, you know, you're operating as a, as a robot, I guess, you know, you're, somebody else solved the challenges and you're the, and you're the, um, you're the muscle that's, that's putting those solutions into, into place. But, uh, so I think, you know, everything worthwhile is full of challenges and that's definitely true for, um, software engineering. I think that, um, there's different types of challenges and how, um, satisfying work is depends on what sorts of challenges that you're facing so you know the ideal like what what 
most of us in software, what we wanted to, to solve are the challenges of how to build complicated things, how to, how to take on um, a really tricky um, project or a really big thing that at the outset seems like, how could we ever build this? Like, I, how can I sit down and make this come to be and then break it down into, into pieces that you can tackle and then, um, and then write each of those and then at the end of the day you've built this really cool cool thing that works um, that's there's lots of challenges in there, there there's um, the, the challenge of knowing how to take something big and break it down into small pieces there's lots of different approaches you can use and knowing what the right way to do that is um, and how to how to verify that how to, how to um, try something and see if it works well and be able to um, pivot to a different direction if it doesn't those are those are all great challenges um, that we you know, that that's that's when we really enjoy software that's where I really enjoy software uh, and then there's other types of challenges that you know I think different people have different appetites for um, but they're all you know, they're all part of the, the calling that God has um, given us in software there's the challenge of um, you know how to fit I've got all this work to do and then there's only you know five days in a week and uh, and so many hours in a day and we said we'd have it done by this time and this part is taking more time and so how do we how do we get it done in that in that amount of time um, or how do we you know change it so that it can get done in this amount of time there's change there's the challenges of um, you know, when you're at, especially when you're at a big company, um, a lot of what, what you're doing has to fit in with what everybody else is doing. You can't build teams by yourself. Um, it takes many, many hundreds of, of people working to do that. And so that means that, you know, you not only have to plan for what, what I need to get done or what my team needs to get done, but how do we, um, that fit that in with the parts that other teams need to get done and what if they change their minds in the middle of when that needs to get done there's lots of challenges that way um, and and then the, I guess there's um, just like in any you know, office environment there's the interpersonal challenges of just you know, we've got very different personalities that need to work together to make this um, project successful and to keep our team operating well and how do we um, how do we just get things done while still um, you know, still building good relationships with each other? Um, those are all all kinds of. Yeah, there's, I'm sure there's lots of other yeah. types. That no, it's good. Come up as well. Yeah, some of those are pretty universal, and you know, some of those more specific. What is one thing you think consumers of your service should hear? I think that for teams, both for education users that are that my team caters to specifically and just in general, I think people underuse the like the, the teams and channels side of teams. Teams has the the chats which are just kind of, you know, one on one or, or group chats that is a pretty familiar concept for people and so I think because it's familiar, um, you know, it's the same. It's the same basic offering as like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or um, you know Signal or any number of other messaging apps. That's what people gravitate towards. But I think that a lot of the unique value of Teams is in uh, Teams and channels and how that creates a, uh, especially if you have a you know organization that's a number of people and that will be bringing in more people over time. Um, those. The, the teams and channels create kind of a, a space that people can go to to learn about what's important inside your organization. Um, things can persist in those teams and channels in a better way than just kind of the, the stream of, of chat messages going up. It's easier to bring in new people in, into that space. Um, so I think that just if you, if teams and ch if you use teams, um, and teams and channels aren't a major part of your workflow. Um, just explore them more and see if see if you can find ways to leverage them. Referencing back to kind of the theme, where you know the 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 inspiration for this, you know, where where no oxen are, the, the trough is clean, but much increase comes from the strength of an ox. Um, 
can you describe a Proverbs 14.4 experience that you've had where you've had to embrace the mess that comes with hard work in order to get the you know, get fruitful results mm -hmm. from that? So we've been a good one to prepare for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, do you want to come and be a part of our video? Well, we're just filming, so one of the, the only thing you have to do to be a part of the video is you have to answer the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, well, Sam asked me if he want, if I wanted to be, um, if I wanted to help him with his restaurant, because he wanted to be a, um, a chef when he grew up, and I do too. Oh, very cool. So I'm going to help him. To get, to get Sam's restaurant? Yeah. Cool, sweet. Love that answer. I think with the nature of solving really hard and complicated problems in software is that, um, you really have to fully engage your brain on those problems um, some of the time. Like some, some of the time you can just kind of go on autopilot and, but some of the time it really takes, you know, every bit of like mental attention and energy that you can throw at it to, to solve a problem. And the, the modern office environment, like open office and um, lots of different communication channels that are always there's always something there, not to mention the rest of the internet that's there as a distraction. Um, it's really hard to build up that level of focus during the ordinary course of the, the day. So I think that some of the mess that, that that leads to for me is that some of the time when I get a hard problem, the only way I can solve it is by staying up half the night working on it because that's the only that it, it takes several hours of uninterrupted focus and the only time that there's ever time for that is in the in the middle of the night when everybody else is is asleep and so um, being able to you know accept that that happens sometimes that that's required sometimes and uh, and to embrace that even if it doesn't fit into the like box of neatly scheduled working hours what is one principle or work lesson in general that people on social media need to be reminded of right now? I should have looked up the reference word, but what's the proverb that says, in the multitude of words, sin is not yeah. lacking, in multitude of speech, sin is not lacking. I guess, I don't know if it's, um, I don't know what it is about social media that makes people feel like they have to speak to things that they don't really understand or, or speak to things that they're not really qualified to speak for, but um, there is just a lot of value in not not saying anything. Yeah. you know if it's if it, there's the controversy of the day or um you know just some like something that you think is really gonna really gonna stump your your political opponents or, or whatever it, it you know it, it probably doesn't need to be broadcasted to the whole world yeah. on social media there's just um you know, to share it with your share it with your friends that's that's great to you know sharpen iron with your with your friends and to develop your your speaking abilities and to build each other up that way, but uh, but there's a whole lot that's out there on social media that uh, just really there's no there's no call for it. Yeah. It's, not, it's not benefiting anybody for you to to blast every thought that you have. Yeah, well, that's very that's very proverbial as as well. I, I think of it even I would go further. You know, I mean you you sort of qualify that by saying that you know. You, you know, you're not qualified to speak on. There are things that, that you could be very qualified to speak on and that you still shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, I think, you know, Proverbs says, you know, wisdom rests in the heart of, uh, you know, of, 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 a, of a wise, you know, of a wise person. I can't remember the exact wording. Mm -hmm. but, but the idea that it, that it, it doesn't have to get out. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the opposite of that is just whatever is at the top of mind has to get out all the time. You know, and it can be, can be stuff you know well and are qualified to speak on, or can be stuff that you know you're not at all qualified. Which there's plenty of that, of course, in social media. But but I yeah I think that's a great principle to be reminded of is that you know whether you know it or not, yeah, there should be a fairly high bars to when you feel like you need to enter into the fray, mm -hmm. um, especially in the very impersonal fray of you know, the social media world. So, um, What's uh, one thing, unique thing that you do on a regular basis that you think helps you to excel at your work or succeed in your work? 
I think that probably my most unique skill in my workplace is written communication. I think um, I've said, I think I've said this before at open houses for Providence or um, things of that nature, but uh, a lot of a lot of engineers went into engineering because they didn't want to they, they wanted to you know, just talk to machines and not, yeah. not talk to humans and um, and you know it can definitely be there's a, there's a lot that's appealing about that but uh, as an engineer if you can only talk to machines then you are only as valuable as whoever is managing you at your at your job because somebody is going to have to talk to the humans and see yeah. what the see what humans need and see what you know resources humans have to provide you and uh, and that's going to be the one who's you know determining your effectiveness if you can only talk to a machine then you are essentially just a, you know a tool that that somebody else has to has to wield for you to be effective and um, so it is really critical to be able to communicate well if you're going to you know, rise to, to the mastery of, of your profession as a software engineer. Um, and at a, um, at a big company especially, written communication is worth its weight in gold. Like quality written communication is worth its weight in gold because you have so many different people that, for anything that you want to communicate, you have so many different people that need to understand it. There's going to be, you know, people that are high later that need to understand it. There's going to be people that you didn't know initially needed to hear it that need to hear it. And there's going to be people in different time zones that need to understand it. And it's really hard to make um, casual communication, inter like direct interpersonal communication scale um, across all those scenarios in a big company. And so being able to express clear written communication is super valuable and um, the only way to improve at that is just to practice it uh, and so that's something that you know, my background at, at Providence we writing was a major major focus there and I think that as a result of that background I've had the confidence to just write a lot more on the job than other than other um, engineers do and I think that's really it's valuable to the team and it's valuable to my career. Um, I think that's probably my most unique contribution. That's great. Well, we're going to bring this in for a landing here. Um, what's one book you've read in the last year that you would recommend? I would recommend uh, In the House of Tom Bombadil by C.R. Wiley. Um, it's a short, short book. It's really you know, like it could be a couple of blog posts, but uh, it's, it's nice. You can get it from can impress in a nice, um, beautiful little hardback uh, volume, and it's. Uh, um, I've read some books by C. R. Wiley before. He writes a lot about Christian manhood, and um, I expected it to be primarily focused on Christian manhood, using Tom Bombadil as kind of a jumping-off point to talk about Christian manhood. But it's actually like almost a scholarly investigation of. Tom Bombadil in The Lord of the Rings. It's it's just it's heavily focused on let's learn everything that we can about Tom Bombadil, um, kind of a mysterious figure in the in the book of Lord of the Rings from everything within the text of Lord of the Rings, everything that Tolkien wrote about him in letters outside of that. What and I don't think he appears much in Tolkien's other writings like the, the Cimmerillion, but just um, let's look at Tolkien's. Uh, folk influences that fed into the Lord of the Rings and and he, it, and it does um, it does work all that towards a, a point about Tom Bombadil embodying Christian manhood which is um, which is very uh, valuable but uh, I think I was just kind of delighted with how with how seriously the book grapples with the text of the Lord of the Rings because that's my that's my favorite book of all yeah. time of course and uh, and it's really it's really satisfying to read something 
engaging with it so deeply. I recommend that. So, um, question, who's the most influential figure in your life? And there, there's a qualifier here in, on the list. And I'm going to add one, one additional qualifier, just to take it off the table so you don't feel any pressure. So, other than me, your father, or biblical characters. Okay. Everybody else said their father, so yeah. that's not really fair. That I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got put on the spot yeah. actually. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I think I would probably say, so it doesn't have to be a living person. Oh. But it can't be a biblical character. All right, and I think I would say C.S. Lewis. Um, I think, you know, you, it's hard to not profit by, for any given, for any given chunk of time you have, it's hard to not, I think reading C.S. Lewis is kind of the, you know, they talk about like a replacement level player in, in baseball, and like you got your wins above replacement, like reading C.S. Lewis, you, you can just think of that as like your default for filling a chunk of time, and uh, you need to justify why you're not doing that with a given, <laughs> that's obviously an exaggeration, but uh, he's written so much and thought um, thought so deeply about um, about God and about how we relate to God and how, about how we relate to one another, and uh, it's not necessarily um, more than other historical figures, but it is tailored to the, you know, to the modern world, so yes, this is at the beginning of the modern era through the through the um, early stages of the modern era and he was also very foresighted about you know where where the world was going where the the culture was going and so um, I think that just reading C.S. Lewis in general has had a major impact on me um, and it's probably the most influential okay. Okay, the last question. If we record another video a year from now, what life or work updates do you expect to have? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say so, something that for work that I think is safe for me to say is that I, um, I'm working on a tutorial for, uh, writing a tutorial for engineers and teams that I think will be valuable for people all across the, or for engineers across all of teams and uh, so I, my goal is within the next year to have that um, available for everybody and um, to have gotten good feedback on that. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. It's been so. wonderful. Thank you guys. Well, thank you. Ransom and Sam nice. and Evie, you guys did great. Thank you guys for coming to watch and to participate. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what they did yet. What? What? Like, what do we do? Or what? Why, are we, why are we looking at you like we wanted to say something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was it. No reason. No reason. You just did a great job. <laughs>